All right, Hutch. Yes. Hutch, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Uh, Venice Beach, California. Venice, Los Angeles here. Mm -hmm. um, Tell me about your parents. You had mom and dad? Yeah, I, I have a father. My, my mother um, split when I was young, when I was six. So I was raised by my dad, single dad. Good man. How would you describe your childhood? Um, uh, I, I would say less than desirable. Uh, my, my, my mom split when I was six. So she split from my dad for his brother. So there was, there was dad and then there was Uncle Jerry dad. And um, he was a terror Topanga. He lived in a place called Topanga Canyon. He was known for being nuts up there. So we had to, mandatory visits. It was not, it was mandatory. Let's say that, you know, had to. You made it through high school? I did, I did. I graduated high school. Um, in 2002, I think, I aged myself. Um, but what did you, you do after school? Oh, well, in school I started getting in trouble. I started getting in good trouble. In to my teen years, I was an angry. I was overweight. I grew too fast, and um, I uh, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of money. So Los Angeles is very. Um, Let's say they're, they're superficial, you know, what, you, what you're wearing, what you look like, the things you have on you is what you are, is how I, it was perceived. And um, we didn't have much of anything. So I wasn't really treated, <laughs> you know, in the cool kid classes and stuff. So I had to act out. Acting out was a good way of getting people to either look at me the way I want them to or not look at me at all. So... And then after school? After school, I joined the Army. I was getting into trouble, in a lot of trouble. And this is right after 9-11. So 9-11 happened, and then I was a senior in high school. So I joined right out of high school, basically. I had a buddy that was going in, my buddy Ryan, and um, he said, hey, dude, I'm doing it. You know, you got to get out of here. You know, so why don't you, why don't we do it together? So we did. We joined the buddy program, and then I wound up in... Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in the 82nd Airborne Division, and deployed to Afghanistan in 2005. And that was my first introduction to adulthood, was <laughs> deploying to a third world country. So you went to Afghanistan? Went to Afghanistan in 2005. Um, Tell me about that. I learned some things. I, we, were, we were artillery in Afghanistan, so we did... Um, we, we were in this place called the Kaust Bowl, and it was right on the border of Pakistan, really near the border of Pakistan, northeastern part of Afghanistan, northeast province. And um, we, we basically held this border with our artillery pieces by blowing people up, you know. And that was what we were being introduced to as well, was they were blowing us up and we were returning fire and stuff like that. Not much small arms fire at all. Not much face-to-face um, -face interaction with, with the enemy. It was more, they'd shoot rockets or mortars or some SF base would need support and we would support them. And yeah, that's, yeah. Nobody got hurt in my unit during that deployment, thankfully. That was, uh, it was one of the better ones, I guess. The better deployments of my two deployments. That one, shape, it more created bonds between us. We got really close, tight knit, things of that nature. And then um, we came back with this, like a good feeling. Like we accomplished something. Like there was something that needed to be done. We were sent there to do it. And then we came back and it was done. You know, and um, the day we got back to Fort Bragg, my dad, I remember my dad was there, but I remember they gave us our deployment orders to Iraq that day, the day we got back. The day you got back, you get news you're leaving again. Yeah, in 365 mm -hmm. days, you will be returning to Iraq. And that was in 2006 is when we got to, no, yeah, 2007. So I went to Afghanistan in 2005, 2006, spent 365 days back. On day 366, I was on my way to Iraq. So then, so then we, spend, we spend a year back and um, it was a good year. We were full of like excitement and youth and um, 
this feeling of accomplishment and love. We had this bond, a camaraderie that was real. It was real. And I miss that more than anything. But, and then we, we deployed to Iraq and the whole thing flipped upside down on our heads. That's when it changed. We went from artillery to, there wasn't such a need for artillery because it's in indirect fire, right? There's a lot of collateral damage, especially in an urban environment. In an urban city, you start shooting artillery rounds, big artillery rounds, and things go bad. So they switched our unit into convoy escort teams, set teams is what they call them. Um, and um, these teams, what we did was there was about five gun trucks, Humvees armored with heavy, you know, he heavy, um, heavy, you know, guns. We were big, we used large weapons on them. And um, they, we would take five gun trucks and escort like 30 or 40 18 wheelers over like a kilometer wide long strip. So it was, uh, the convoys were like over half a mile from the first truck to the last truck and five trucks to guard 30, um, you know, big wheelers on what was called the main supply route, Tampa. And it went from Kuwait to Turkey and it cut straight through the center of the country, goes through Baghdad and kind of skirts the west side of Baghdad and then comes out and around and keeps heading north to, to create Kirkuk, all of it. And it goes up to Turkey. Um, and uh, that's, that was like the worst place you could be in 2007, in 2008. We were at the end of the surge. So General Petraeus had called up the surge. This, he wanted all these boots on the ground. He wanted all these soldiers to hold down the city. I mean, to hold down the country in order to rectify what needed to be done, I guess. And so he called for the surge is what it was called. And there was, I think it was like, I don't know, I couldn't tell you, tens of thousands of troops that were called on top of, additionally, on top of what was already in country. And um, we were at the tail end of that. And um, yeah, convoys, 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 convoys. And the worst place you could be at that time, because they had started, they had started, we started picking up on the way that they were, you know, they, they were, they stopped engaging so front, um, Frontline, like, um, what's the word? Not, not so, um, they wouldn't engage so face-to-face -face as much as they, it was all IEDs, improvised explosive devices, blowing us up. And then I, um, IEDs and EFPs, these like, um, they were taking these like, it looked like a coffee can. They take a, a cylinder, like a cylindrical, um, a cylinder, and then they would take nickel and copper or just copper and concave it and put it on the end and then put some sort of plastic explosive in there, right? And then they would, they would chip out a, a curb and set it in there and then put like the, the insulation foam and put it with dirt and then you, couldn't even, you wouldn't even know it was there. And then when they blow this thing, it burns at like 9,000 degrees and it's moving through steel like it's not there. And, and it's like a softball of molten copper moving extremely fast and the, the, it made our armor like not like it wasn't there literally and people were getting fucked up fucked up tearing people in 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 pieces it was literally splitting people in half um it was taking like it would take like four, like it could take a, a fully armored truck with with four well, um, like well put together men and liquidate them in a second, in a second. It could take everything they had and lay it to waste without, and this is costing them nothing, you know, it's costing them 10 bucks. And the way we were told is it was like, it was in a, I don't know, I don't know where they got the technology, but I'm sure it came from us. At some point, you know, it came from us through Iran and then from Iran and it came and bit us back in the ass. And um, what, witnessing human beings display carnage upon each other in your early 20s is not natural. No matter how much we see war as a natural state of being. 
no matter how much we think it is normal to be at war, there's nothing natural about it. The way that people, a young man can turn into a monster and then go right back to being a young man is, it's breathtaking. Looking back at what we were capable of doing or what I saw friends be capable of doing and, and then going back and returning to their families, you know? Picking up their kid, coming off the plane and picking up their little girl and spinning around and kissing them on the face and sitting back down and, and thinking, I saw you do some shit that would fucking make that little girl throw it for the rest of her life, you know? But then, and then you hear, this, you hear a very interesting cliche, you had to. You did what you had to do. And it's like, you're right. You're right. You got us there. We did what we had to do. But how much of it was absolutely necessary? You know, the only way I've been able to, to um, come to terms with the things that, have, uh, that I witnessed there and the things that I participated in was like this. If I see America's military as a, as a system, and it plays a part in a larger system of, the, of a world peace, right? So the military might of the United States having the ability to take hundreds of thousands of men, place them in a foreign country quickly, overthrow the government, and do it by force with guns and willing to apply death to as many people as needed to do so, kept the world in somewhat at peace. Our ability to show that might I believe, has kept the world relatively at peace. Right now, I wouldn't say so with the current state of affairs in, in, um, in Ukraine, but the, the idea that somebody can do that, that a country, a nation is capable of doing that, I like to say that my participation in that is a, a form of security and freedom for some. That's the only way I've been able to justify or chalk up what I participated in as okay, as something that was necessary. Because do I believe that anybody's individual freedoms at home were safer due to my, due to the things that I did over there? Um, it, like it, like um, on its face, no. On its face, no. But as a part of that system, yes. You know, I don't believe that, that anybody was safer because my ability to take another human life at, call, at will, on call, um, kept, I guess that's the system that, that, that works. That's the system that kept everybody safer. But my, my actual doing it, participating in it, knowing it to be what was right at the time, no, no. I don't believe anybody's freedoms were individually safer because I took human life at that time. And now to come home at 24 and try to justify all that and, and put it in a picture that is pretty is impossible. It was impossible. And I got hurt. So because I got hurt, I was given drugs. And taking those drugs made things much easier to cope with. If I can take a substance and immediately control an emotion, this emotion bothers me, it makes me uncomfortable, I can take this substance and it will fucking curb that for a moment. That is my new natural state of being, was where I went. That was my new natural state of being. And um, I was also <clears throat> involved in a crime committed in Iraq. I wasn't there. I mean, it's all public record now, but like I wasn't there when it happened. There was money stolen, U.S. currency, bulk U.S. currency stolen from the Department of Finance at the DOD in Iraq 
and money was mailed to me and other people. And I got in trouble for that. You know, I ended up getting arrested for it and everything like that. And did, you know, was right down here on Alameda <laughs> at the MDC there, Metropolitan Desert Center. And did some, did, did my federal time for that. Or, you know, paid back my debt that way. Well, what was the hardest thing you personally had to experience while you were there? In Iraq? Yeah, I mean like. Coping, um, somebody that you love, care for being there, and then the next day they're not. Hmm. That was my first experience of real death. My first experience of death was introduced me in that manner. I, you know, nobody in my family really died when I was a kid. I had no real tragic, you know, I had a couple friends in high school that like, you know, car accident, um, a suicide, a drug overdose, uh, gang violence. There's plenty of gang violence in my high school, plenty of gang violence. Um, Venice High in the late 90s was, was yeah. It was a trip. It was a trip, and we we're and white, white being Caucasian was a minority in the school. So anywhere you're a minority, you're going to feel it. You're going to know it. You know you're going to you're going to feel that that thing of that. But back to Iraq, that was my only introduction to death. Was was that manner? Was people? Was small things that you think of as natural causes almost? You know, people, kids die young. You know, things happen when you're in school and uh, when you're a kid, accidents and things like that. But then going to Iraq and having somebody that you know is your friend, your family, your loved one. And your brothers are your friends, your family, your loved ones there. They are the people that you care about the most and they are the most important thing in the world to you. Um, disappear. <laughs> no trace, like that was it. You know, when an IED goes off and a truck goes up and it's a mushroom cloud and the doors go flying, there's no remnants of your friend, friends. There's no, nothing to send home, you know. That's it, it's, a, it's vapor. And uh, dealing with that was not easy. Coming back, you know, I'd be on base and, and another set team would be out and we'd get the news. You know, somebody, a radio would come in and somebody run and bang on it. Hey, you hear what happened? No, what happened? What's his name, lost a leg. And it's like, lost a fucking leg? He's 22 years old, what do you mean lost a leg? You know, and these are realities that everybody thinks of as like, oh, well, that's what you were doing. It's like, oh, you go try it. You, you tell me that's natural. The feeling you get in your heart when you know that you could be the next person to lose a fucking leg of your life. It's not easy. It's not easy. And that's the part that I think people fail to grasp is that, yes, we're expected to do it. Yes, I volunteered. I know this. Um, but in the end, when it's all said and done, how much of it, you know, when people get, do crimes, okay, for example, when somebody commits a crime and they go to jail, you lay up at night and you think, fuck, I did this crime, I'm in jail for it, this fucking sucks, you know? But when you go to war and you come back, it, it's not as easy to justify like that. It's not so cut and dry. It's not so black and white like, oh, I went to war. That's why I snatched that life up. That's why I went over there and did what I did. And it's easy to say it, I guess, and it's, it's easier to write it down on paper, but it's not easy to feel it. There are so many feelings that come along with this shit. Um, when, you, when, you, um, when, you, when you breach a, a house or breach a, 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 a building or somewhere that needs to be breached, um, whoever, you know, tears the hinges out and kicks the door, turns around immediately, usually, or that's what, that was the tactic then. Um, so I was a number four man, a door guy, for one of these hits, for one of these things, and it was a courtyard. And we hit the courtyard door and move into the building, to the house, and you can hear the rustling of people. So, so you're, you're blowing the hinges off a door? Right, so you, I'm hearing on the other side of the door, like we're listening to see what's going, like, and you can hear mumbling and people rustling around a bit. So I go to blow, blow the hinges, I hit the top hinge, hit the bottom hinge with a, a Mossberg 500 shotgun, and I go for the center hinge and I pause for a second, and it's, fuck it, boom, and I hit the center hinge, kick the door in. In my mind, I thought I could kick this door in without blowing that hinge, I don't know why. But that flashed, that flashed to me at that point, was you, don't, you might not have to hit this hinge. I kick the door down, door comes down, and before I can turn around, I see what was on the other side of that hinge, that center hinge. And it was somebody that was the size of about a center hinge. So you can do the math on that. 
a center hinge leaves somewhere around three, four feet on a door. So there was something on the other side of that hinge and the kid was hiding so that when the door went open, it would swing open, he'd be behind it. And not want to see him, you know? And I live with that. And that's an emotion that you have to put down. In your early 20s? Today. Every day of your life? Today, yeah. And I have a nine-year-old son. And he's about that height. And the crazy part is that imagine the kid growing up with you in your dreams, in your nightmares, with half a fucking head and no face. But as you grow older, so do they. Imagine that. So I've had nightmares recent, this year, to where the fucking kid is an adult with the same face and head missing, walking around in the background of the dream. That will wake you up with some anxiety. That'll put a needle in your arm. That'll put you on some fucking drugs. Now, it seems like a cartoon, you know, just to say it out loud, you know. That's a reality for me. Now, tell me that you had to do what you had to do. You know? Tell me those words bring me comfort. Would bring anybody comfort in that situation. There is no comfort for that. That is human carnage. That is the worst of humanity. And for you to have somebody pat me on the back and put a ribbon on my chest and say, you did a good job this year. Well, eat you alive. It eats you to your soul. I, fe- I felt like I used to have my military ID and people used to like looking at it because you could see the difference in what I was as a human being when I first got back and they took the picture of the ID. I look so much different than I do now. There's so much life in me now because I've done so much work on it, you know. But it has taken as much time working on my mind to be a functioning disabled vet in my manner and to be so high functioning has taken extensive work. A lot of awareness. Therapy? Oh yeah. Therapy beyond, yeah, therapy, being open-minded to therapy, to, to taking my meds, I take medication. Um, I take no, um, no immediate cause, no immediate, I take no immediate effect medications. So you can't take it and get a feeling, to, you know, if they're all, you know, you have to take them for two or three weeks before they start to take effect. And they've been very helpful for me to slow down and to catch things before my emotions take over my entire body and mind and run along with the the way they do. Um, Anger was the beginning. And because of that, my brother made me stop drinking. He said, I will never, my, my brother and I are very close and he said, I'll never be around you if you drink. So I stopped drinking because I would black out and say things, things were coming out of my mouth, like what I just told you, and people would start crying. And I'm looking at them and spitting at them, and you know, they're like, what's wrong with you, man? You know, what's wrong with you? And, and they felt bad for me, you know? A lot of people felt bad. And I fucking, I scoffed at their pity. And you don't understand is a cliche phrase in this, you know? Um, you don't understand is a, is a cliche phrase that we like to say. It's okay is a phrase that other people like to say. You had to do it is another thing people like to say. These phrases should all be very, you know, we should be very, very, very careful with these things. Every individual veteran, every veteran that is affected by war is individually affected and has their individual, their emotions are triggered differently than other people with a similar story. Or somebody could have been the same, you know, uh, breach team as me that don't feel the same that I do. You know, didn't, don't, don't have the same regrets or threw up as they were coming in the room, you know? 
Um, I remember shaking and un uncontrollably shaking and thinking this is powerful. Whatever's happening to me is powerful, you know? There are certain drugs I've done that I've said, wow, this is a powerful substance. And there are things that can affect our emotions that I don't think can be described by a doctor or, you know, or by, I don't think you can be cured by medication. I think it's all an individual journey, you know, to get to the bottom of what I've done, what's been done to me. How do I perceive these things? How do I apply that perception to my current state of being? Um, I would hope anybody, anybody that's been through that would seek help. Because otherwise you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else. You know, because our emotions become so powerful, we cannot control ourselves. And this is a part of humanity. You know, this is what a part of what makes us human. When we love, we love big. And when we hurt, we hurt big. And these big emotions are dangerous. They can be very, very dangerous, I believe. Um, I've learned how to deal with these things. My son was born, when my son was born in 2013, and I don't, this doesn't happen for everyone, but I am one of these cliche cases that it changed my life. My baby, he gave me a reason to live. And he was, a, he was not an accident, but he was accidental. <laughs> he happened accidentally, but he's not an accident. Um, my son was born, uh, he was conceived in rehab. I, <laughs> I was, she winked, I smiled. There was day room two, it was open Saturday night, and my son was born. Um, she's not been a part of his life at all. She's a meth addict and has been gone his entire life. He's never met her. He's asked me questions recently about her, and um, I don't talk down on her, and there's no need. She wasn't there. And when you're a parent that isn't there or not present, the other parent doesn't have to talk down on you. The kid will know. When they grow up, they know. <laughs> They'll remember every bit of time you weren't there. You're, so You're raising your son. By myself, and I have. And, I mean, I have a good family. My father's a great man, and he's helped me when he can and when I need it. I have brothers and sisters that have, you know, showed up for me when it comes to that, to being a father. And I've had a good experience as a father. My son is happy to be my son, and I'm happy to be his dad. You know, and that is the only thing I can say that has taken me out of, that has get, put humanity back in me, has started to rebuild my soul. And my son, my son will wake me up at night, because we still sleep in the same bed sometimes. And he'll wake me up and, and Dad, Dad, you're okay, Dad, you're okay. And I know I was having a nightmare, you know, because my son's shaking me and telling me, it's okay, Dad, you're okay. My baby, my baby has had to wake me up and say, you're okay, Dad. You know, he's nine. He turns nine in July. So he kind of understands what you he went through. He does. And my son is extremely empathetic. And he's such a good boy. He's, he doesn't, he didn't have the same problems I did when I was young. You know, I was, my father was um, emotionally inept. And I don't blame him. My dad's a Vietnam vet. His dad was a World War II vet, you know, but my father just cannot express emotions verbally, you know, and luckily I learned to do that because I didn't want my son to have the same experience as I did. I didn't want my son, my father was a bit hard with his hand, you know, I'm not going to say my dad was an abusive son of a bitch, but he was tough, you know, he was tough and he did it by himself. He raised us alone, you know, my mom split. So I had that going for me was I was raised by a good single father, you know, and my dad never drank in front of us. He never smoked cigarettes, never smoked drugs, nothing in front of us. Um, my son's never seen me drunk. He seen me on drugs, but I don't think he knew it. You know, I've never, I don't change. What, what drug did you play around with? I've messed around with them all, but uh, primarily was, was heroin. And you're clean now? Yeah. How long, had how long have you been clean? Um, uh, this run has been three and a half years so before that it was um it was five but yeah i've been clean most 90 percent of my son's life luckily and when i wasn't i asked somebody that was clean to take care of him because i didn't want him to see me like that you know 
and he understands now. And I mean, I've, I've had little relapses and stuff, you know, stuff in between. When I say three and a half years, I don't, I don't, I'm not counting it like, like, um, every, you know, every single day you've been clean. You know, if I got high in between here on this weekend, I got high that weekend, but I've gone on no destroy my life runs or use drugs to where, to, to, to a part of where my life has been in detriment, you know, due to it, luckily, you know, and I, I sought help. And because I sought help, I have financial assistance from the VA. I get a, um, I get a, um, you know, the VA gives me a compensation every month for the, the amount of my life that has changed due to the war. So that's a good thing. That helps us a lot, you know, that always pays the rent. It's hard to hold a job for more than a year. I don't know why. I'm a good employee, but... Since, since the war? Yeah, since the war. It's, I guess they attribute it to the PTSD. I guess it's a common thing for guys with my diagnosis. I have severe post-traumatic stress disorder from prolonged combat exposure is, was, is the diagnosis. And what that turns into is that, I guess, I don't get bored, but I don't find the same meaning in the stuff I do, you know? I guess I, I can't find a deep meaning in anything that I do that keeps me occupied from within the year. So I'll, I'll start working, I'll get really good at it, and then I'll, I'll split. As soon as I feel like I've, I've mastered it, I'm out, you know? And that's disappointing because there have been some people have put some really good opportunities in front of me, and I've, you know, I've, I haven't, I don't think I've shit on them as much as I just wasn't able to give them what they deserved. Was they took all this time and trained me to do something. And then I never really, they never really got the payoff, but. I imagine after seeing the things you saw and experiencing what you experienced, to do a job that doesn't have a tremendous amount of meaning just ends up feeling really empty quickly. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I never really looked at it like that. I never put it that way meaningful. That's, I guess that's from today I said that. I'm glad I did. I'm, I haven't been able to find, I had meaning. I felt like there was a, a lot of meaning in what I was doing there. Whether it was right or wrong, there was, a, there was meaning. And there was a cause that I hid behind. It's, it's hard to seek deep meaning. After things in your life is where on a day-to-day -day basis, everything is like life or death, as they say. It's not that simple, but it is. You can paint it that way. Um, how do you find meaning in hanging drywall or, or serving a person food? You know? And I'm not saying that there isn't. What I'm saying is the, the journey to find that meaning becomes very harrowing. You know, it takes a lot to find meaning in something that's seemingly so trivial after that, after you experience something of that manner. You know, um, I... I've tried, I've tried. I did, I've done, I did hardwood floors for a long time, electrical work, I did um, tattooing. I've done a lot of things that I like doing, but I don't, I, I'm gonna end up having to work with people. If I don't work with people, I won't succeed, I don't think. Because I find, like, the meaning that I found in my journey is that being able to relate with somebody, or to say to somebody, hey man, I do get it. Is, is better than anything else. You know, I did, I did work in treatment for a long time. I worked in treatment. That's, that, that, was, um, that was very fulfilling, working in treatment. I ended up working for the scumbag who ended, like, is in prison for life now. So, uh, you know, in the end, it didn't feel so good. But in the, in the moment, helping people really felt meaningful. And that's the only thing that I think you know, if you're if you're if there's a veteran struggling, find another veteran that's struggling, and I guarantee you guys will, you guys will work something out. You know, I've there's a lot of cool community-based veterans veteran programs and stuff like that that help each other, but that one-on-one, -on -one, that that being able to stand next to each other and say you, we don't have to say it, we get it. You know, I understand problems that people are having in these in these small tasks. If they're veterans, 
sometimes I, I understand it better than they do, or vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, they, they understand my problems better than I do. Um, it's one, that's one thing is that, that that camaraderie never dies. That camaraderie never dies. I mean, you find another veteran or somebody that's experienced what you've experienced, explore their perception. How did they see their problem? How did it affect them emotionally? How did they, how are they dealing with it? How have they dealt with it? Helping people has been the only thing that I've felt, I've found that, that brings meaning to my life. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. And it's, it's a, I know I don't know how to pursue it. <laughs> you know, I don't know which route to go or that, but at least I know it. At least you're, I know you're that. Probably, you're probably still healing even after yeah. all these years. Yeah. At least my son would tell you I am. What's your view on war? Gosh. You have airborne tattooed on your forehead, so. Yeah, I do. Um, my view on war is this, is that it has, it is for the last couple thousand years, been a natural state of being for humanity. I don't think it's natural. You know, um, it has been a badge I've been able to wear proudly and that I've been able to use to keep people at bay, people away from me that, that may be dangerous. Or, you know, maybe I've used it as a, um, as a mask. We all wear masks and my veteran mask is a, is a good one. It, it, it gives people a pre, it, it kind of puts people at a, at a certain way of saying, okay, this person is, I can assume this make some assumptions that I may be a little more dangerous than the average person. I may understand death better than the average person. I may have dealt death. I may have all these things may. So you have to kind of, you know, you figure me out before you can step all over me, which has been very helpful. And, um, but my view on war is that it's the most necessary, unnecessary thing we, we do. It's the most unnecessary, necessary thing we do. Whichever way you want to spin it, it seems that we can't get away from it, but it's wrong. There's no time that taking another human being's life is natural or okay. Even if you say, oh, well, I did it to save this person. It's like, well, that person shouldn't have been doing it. You know, if you had to kill someone because they were going to kill you, doesn't mean it's natural that they were trying to, what they were trying to do wasn't natural. It wasn't right, you know? So there's no time that taking another human being's life is natural or, or right. I think if we all could get that through our fucking heads, <laughs> we'd be a lot better off, you know, if that wasn't a solution. You know, war is a solution to what people want. If, you, if, you, if I want something and I'm not getting it, I take enough life to where people say, I don't want you to take mine, so here. That is not an insane concept to everyone? How is that not ins pure insanity? Where it's, I, and how do you, how do you stop it? with war, right? He, you know, when somebody has a stick, you got to get a bigger stick. I, where does the cycle, like, where do we get a break in this closed loop? You know, because we've already committed so much atrocity and war and so much war. There's no break in the loop. It's a closed loop cycle. Now it's, it's running itself. It's like, oh, it's a natural state. It's like, oh, what happened? Oh, this person isn't doing what we want them to. Oh, why not? It doesn't matter. Kill him. It's like, fuck, man. You know, oh, these people are coming across this invisible line we have painted as our border. And we say that this is ours and that's yours and you don't come over here without our permission. And if we don't give you permission, you stay. You stay. And if you don't like it, we'll kill you. Fuck, man. How is that the end all? How is the, you know, how has that become our, our, our end all? You don't like my gangster? I don't like your gangster? Bang, you're dead. That's the end all? I don't think religion is doing a very good job, but God, we got to have a better way. There's got to be, there's got to be, I know it's just you and me talking, I'm sorry, but 
there's got to be something more than that. You'd think after all these years, we'd figure some other way. Human discourse, man. <laughs> you know, tradition has been the death of human discourse. I don't, you know, I, I don't want my son to live in a world of war. He knows, I've been able to tell, he knows what's going on right now in Ukraine is wrong. He knows it's wrong. Whether our participation and utilizing it as a proxy country is, is wrong or not, it's all wrong. No one should have to die over somebody else's opinion or belief, you know? And I think a lot of what we do now is we kill in belief, out of our beliefs. We, I can't imagine, man. I can't imagine having to do that again as an adult, as a good person. I'm a good person. I'm not a bad person. Having to do that again. There's no purpose to, you know, there's nothing. There's a hell of a world we live in. <laughs> the smarter we get, the more dangerous we become. Yeah. All right. Hutch, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.